Hello, everyone. Uh, here again to talk about the Gospels, the symbols of the Gospels. We come through a long road. We're nearing the end now. I wanted to do some recapping and uh, summarizing. So before we get started, let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you that we always have uh, the hope that's contained in uh, your word uh, to uh, strengthen us during difficult times, as so many are having during this period that we're in. Uh, in health or uh, or economically one way or another. Uh, we thank you too that we can refresh ourselves in your word, that we can strengthen our faith. Please be with us by your spirit as we once again look into uh, the, the scriptures regarding the gospels and their connections to the rest of the Bible. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we've gone a, a long road. I don't know if uh, all of you have been with me for all the various segments. I tried to summarize a lot as we go along. But we started out with some women characters in the Old Testament. And as we look closely at these characters or women who had challenges having children, uh, if you remember, that we found that they uh, naturally sort of divide and lead us to the natural division of the nation of Israel into its two parts. It always had two parts. Eventually they became two separate kingdoms, but they always were there. The house of Judah in the south, traced its uh, descent all the way back to the man Judah, uh, Jacob's son, and the house of Joseph in the north, which became the kingdom of Israel or Ephraim or Samaria, uh, different uh, periods and circumstances uh, was known by uh, different names or um, uh, in different, uh, under different descriptions. But it uh, traced its lineage back to uh, the patriarch Joseph. And of course, Jay, uh, Jacob had 12 sons. The other sons, mostly the tribes, shrank and became uh, very small appendages to those two houses, the house of Jude and the house of Joseph. And we saw that even with the stories of these women that sort of divide up eventually into streams following those two parts of Israel, they lead us naturally into the New Testament with the women of Judah sort of naturally, lead, naturally leading us into the Gospel of Matthew, those women of the Northern Kingdom leading us to the Gospel of Luke. Then we looked and saw that there is a, uh, a whole series of, uh, of parables and incidents that represent special material, both in Matthew and Luke, and that that special material has ties in Matthew's case back to the history of Judah, in Luke's case to the history of the Northern Kingdom, going all the way back to the man Joseph, and that those affinities, if we can say that, it's, it's not a contradiction, it's a complementary relationship, that those uh, take on the, the symbols of those two houses, which Judah, for Judah, it was the lion, for the northern kingdom, it was the bull. Uh, that naturally that gives us a way to naturally and objectively associate those symbols with those gospels of Matthew with the lion, Luke with the bull. And then Mark, the uh, Gentile gospel, the gospel that has more connections to Rome and the Roman Empire, has a natural connection to the symbolism of the eagle, uh, which uh, that symbol was associated with imperial Gentile powers going all the way back to Egypt, uh, Babylon, uh, Assyria, uh, Greece, all the way to Rome. And uh, so we found that the symbols of the evangelists uh, that were proposed by early Christian fathers, that were proposed to be these faces of these heavenly creatures that we first see in Ezekiel, these uh, four-faced cherubs or tetramorphs, they're sometimes called, meaning four four-shaped creature. And we find a, a, a corresponding group of them in Revelation uh, chapter 4, that the early church fathers, that these had some symbolic prophetic association with the Gospels. And then that makes absolute sense. As our, our study proceeded, we saw that, that there is a way to objectively assign those figures. And finally, in the case of John, the remaining figure, the human face, the man of that group, uh, we saw that that does naturally go with uh, the Gospel of John, the emphasis on Jesus, his insight into humanity, his representing uh, the divine man, the, the, what man should be as God envisions and uh, 
within God's purpose, as God sees man, he sees Jesus as man as he should be, and the emphasis on Jesus' personal identity and John. It all goes together and makes sense. So we have to say that the early church fathers seem to have had the right idea in seeing this relationship, even though it seemed unlikely and improbable and uh, overly imaginative at, at first glance. It turns out that, uh, that their spiritual instincts were were pretty good, I would say. Now, they disagreed over the assignment, uh, you know, which of those symbols went with which gospel. If you remember, the one that is that became the dominant interpretation was from Jerome, who gave the Matthew, the human figure, uh, the, the bull to Luke. Um, he gave the, uh, the eagle to John and uh, uh, the man to, uh, 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 not the man to uh, Mark, it was the, uh, the lion to Mark. And that's what you see in the Middle Ages. You see that assignment. But uh, the other early fathers, they all disagreed among themselves. The one that came closest, I think, to the objective assignment that we arrived at was actually Augustine of Hippo, sometimes known as St. Augustine. Augustine was brilliant. That doesn't mean I agree with everything that uh, Augustine wrote, but he was brilliant. I mean, he was, he was genuinely a genius, whatever his faults were, a uh, brilliant writer, brilliant thinker. And he got two of them right, I think, uh, more than anyone else. That is, he, he felt that the lion should be with Matthew. He felt that the bull should be with Luke. He flipped, he flipped the man and the lion around with, in the case of, uh, of, um, uh, uh, or if it flipped the, uh, uh, the eagle, and I should say, he flipped the eagle and the man around when he got to uh, assigning uh, Mark and John. And I think he got those incorrect. But that's because none of them understood the ethnic spiritual categories of humanity that allow us to see objectively how the gospels sort out they were most of them just intuiting the answer or or sort of freely associating certain characteristics of the gospels with those figures and faces and uh, that's been the traditional method of doing it sort of a sort of a bit of free association of looking at it and uh, and uh, just seeing what feels right to you. But we've come up with something objective and it is extraordinarily improbable that we would find that, that we would actually find an objective way to assign these uh, figures or these faces from Ezekiel and Revelation to the four gospels. It's extraordinarily improbable. It's not just improbable that we would see the alignment with between the the houses of Israel, the Gentile world, and you know those those three animal figures, and then the way the Gospels uh, reflect them, but the logic of that, which isn't apparent, that is as we talked about, you you read Ezekiel and you see the angelic kind of creatures. They're not called angels technically; they they are called cherubs. But uh, he sees these creatures, they have associations going back hundreds of years before Ezekiel into even uh, the, the uh, non-Israelite cultures had the association of these figures together. Uh, but in Ezekiel, we see them and there's no obvious connection between them and the four gospels. There's no immediate rationale for doing it. But we did see that if you consider this very hard, that being cherubs, even though cherubs are never specifically called angels in the Bible, they're given all the characteristics of angels. So we're, I think, entitled to make that leap and say that cherubs are angels. The word angel means messenger. We talked about the fact that in the Bible, messengers, whether uh, superhuman or human messengers, occasionally their appearance would be their message or, or a key part of their message. And so from a prophetic standpoint, that the appearance of these spirit messengers would resemble the way the message, the written message about Jesus would sort out in these separate books. There is a logic to it uh, once we reflect on it uh, closely. It's not, again, something that you immediately appreciate that it would make sense, 
but it does as you think very hard about it. And so that also would be part of the coincidence, if it would be coincidence, and it would have to be coincidental that it does make prophetic sense when you analyze it very closely. Uh, and that all just seems to me to defy, uh, to defy a, a, an explanation from accident. On the other hand, if you try to think about uh, some kind of systematic natural explanation, there is, what would there be in the ordinary historical causes that shape uh, human events? What could there be that would cause this alignment of the gospels with these symbols? You would almost be driven to some kind of teamwork among the evangelists, some kind of coordination where they agree to uh, to have a different, little different emphasis in their books in order to to create this alignment. And that is just so, so far-fetched. I mean, no historian for a minute would consider it. Even uh, believers who have a, uh, say, uh, most believers have a view of the way the Gospels were written and the way they were uh, 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 created. They imagine a very clean, kind of tidy process. But even that clean, tidy process you would see uh, that there are so many differences among the Gospels that are not explained by virtue of simply these differences that we've seen. That is, that Matthew has uh, reproduces these uh, parables, for example, that are tied to the history of Judah. And Luke, even if you take that out, there are differences that remain that are would be so hard to envision as the outcome of teamwork. In other words, if the gospel writers were coordinating enough to uh, complement each other, so to speak, um, uh, purposefully in the way that, uh, that we've, uh, we've been studying about, uh, then they also would probably avoid outright, some of the outright surface contradictions. And I'll, I'll use that term surface contradictions, because of course I believe that these gospels are all inspired and harmonious. But the surface contradictions, for example, if you would look at the infancy story of Matthew, you know, about the, the magi, the star, you know, at, at Christmas time, you always see that part of it represented. There's the star, the magi, Herod, he comes and kills all the babies of Bethlehem. Joseph and Mary have to flee to escape. And then if you look at Luke's infancy story, you know, the census, Joseph and Mary coming, no room at the inn. Uh, there's an angelic choir. There's no star <laughs> that, we, that we see anyway in Luke. There's an angelic choir, which doesn't occur in Matthew. Uh, there are these shepherds that come to see the baby Jesus. Now, I'm not saying those stories cannot be reconciled, that you cannot put them together in some way as part of a larger story. But it's something you have to work hard to do. I mean, see, if you read the stories carefully, you have to work hard to reconcile them. On the other hand, if the writers were actually coordinating as a team doing their writing, you'd think that even if they were going to tell different infancy stories, there would be little accommodations be very easily made so that the stories would be easier to reconcile, that they would uh, more obviously be, be part of one much larger narrative. Or if you take the resurrection appearances on the other end of things in Matthew, where Jesus tells the disciples, go to Galilee, and they go to Galilee, that's where they see Jesus. And in Luke, he says, stay in Jerusalem, <laughs> okay? I mean, it, just read those real carefully against each other, again saying, of course I believe that that they do harmonize uh, in, in, in terms of a deep truth and in, in terms of just the way the stories are told differently and so forth. It's possible to harmonize them, but if the writers were literally working together, I mean, che uh, checking and coordinating with each other, it is just so hard to imagine that uh, those kinds of differences would not be a little more harmoniously uh, cross accommodated, if I can uh, use that term, and and they have not been. And in fact, it just no one, and especially say secular academics, no one pictures a process that was like a teamwork process from the orthodox scholars all the way to hardened 
skeptics, uh, none of them see uh, evidence of a sort of a team writing approach to the production of the Gospels. It's just so irreconcilable with the uh, differences in style and and, uh, and circumstances of, of composition and and just uh, the, the the lack of of, of me- for, for one thing of mentioning of each other of getting any kind of, kind of complimentary mentioning of one gospel by another. Luke has a little note about other gospels that he, he won't even name them, <laughs> you know, let alone endorse them uh, specifically. He do- he doesn't attack them, but but there's just there's just no evidence for uh, a coordinated production and much, much evidence against it, uh, however you read the Gospels. But then, once that's off the table, and once uh, coincidence and a historical accident is seen for the, the, the horrific odds against it uh, in, from so many directions, that it really does drive us toward the inspired nature of the scriptures, I think, to see that kind of coordination that is not humanly produced, has no ordinary historical cause, and yet aligns with such depth and precision. I mean, it's taken me a long time to cover the information. For example, the information that that uh, goes into showing Matthew's uh, special material, its connections with Judah and Luke's with the history of the Northern Kingdom going all the way back to Joseph. It takes time to go through those. You know, it's been hours that we've spent and I haven't covered all of it. You know, I've, I've done some highlights. Actually, there's there's more material that, um, that I could have uh, tried to uh, work in and I just didn't want to take the you know, I had to, to, to compromise in some way with convenience and uh, people being able to digest this in some uh, reasonable length of time. But even at that, it shows the depth of the evidence. Um, it's not the case of, uh, of a couple little odd texts that seem to uh, coordinate in some unusual way. We're talking about a, a deep editorial patterns, deeply embedded in the, the nature of these books and uh, just uh, a prophetic relationship that is uh, profound and profoundly beautiful, I would say, in the Bible. And, has, and, and there are so many connections with other scriptures that go into showing the meaning of the symbols and uh, those are scattered throughout the scriptures, all kinds of different books written in different periods, obviously not written with <laughs> uh, creating this kind of alignment. So I want to emphasize just what a miraculous phenomenon this really is on the literary and historical level. It's a prophetic alignment or relationship, I think, that it takes time to appreciate, but is um, just stunning once it is appreciated. Now, uh, there's one more uh, wrinkle to this that I'd like to cover. Um, as I said, there's more to be said, and uh, you know, there's more probably for me to write in terms of writing about this subject. But we're going to leave it because there are other subjects we need to uh, cover that I'd like to cover in this uh, vlog uh, series uh, that I'm doing. But before we leave the symbols of the evangelists and the sort of the the coloration of the different gospels, how they fit in. I'd like to go to Revelation. So you remember that uh, we've been saying, I'm repeating over and over again, that uh, that these four-faced figures in Ezekiel chapter one have a correspondence to figures that we find in Revelation four, but more often to actually read about them, we've gone to Ezekiel one. So now I'd like I think that we've been in, in Revelation, maybe maybe we have been once or twice, we've done a lot of these studies, but I, I would like to return there now and reread where these figures occur in Revelation and introduce an idea that I um, would guess has never occurred to you about the interpretation of these figures. 
and I'll probably have more to say about it if I do a series on Revelation and the, the visionary symbolism of Revelation. But going to Revelation chapter 4, it's a vision of God on his throne in verse 3. It says, and he who was sitting, this is God, of course, was like a, a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds, and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had, the, had a face like a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. And it talks about them worshiping God along with the 24 elders. Later, the elders or representatives of the elders and creatures periodically speak to John to help reveal uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, to uh, introduce visions or to comment on the visions that John will be having. You see them recur at certain strategic places later in the book. But this is our main view of them as worshiping God. And the ideas abound that most of the ideas are all that these are just, just angels. They're just angels or they're maybe either departed spirits of patriarchs and apostles. Or, uh, uh, but they all, they're all seen as being literal uh, living creatures and living, uh, living beings in heaven. And uh, this uh, partakes of something that I call the video camera in heaven fallacy. <laughs> and that is that, that the vision of John are giving us like what you would see if you took a video camera to heaven um, and, 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 and somehow took videotape of it. And I think that that is um, an erroneous way to look at many of these visions. I think if you look at some of the other visions in John, if you go to chapter five, for example, you'll see right away that runs into some real problems trying to in interpret it that way as a video camera view of heaven. I think what it is is a view of invisible realities rendered into visionary symbols and figures. That is the invisible in some respect or other not necessarily in the respect in the uh, in the respect that we might uh, first anticipate, but the invisible is being rendered into something picturable in the mind. Now, the early fathers, starting with Irenaeus, Irenaeus simply says the four creatures: the lion, calf, man, eagle, of verse seven. I've read that he simply says they are the Gospels. Now think about that. Uh, they are the Gospels. He is apparently saying that he thinks these figures represent the Gospels. Now think about that possibility. It may seem like, oh no, but these are creatures. Okay, but stop and think for a moment. If you were going to personify the Gospels, how would you how would you represent the Gospels as if they were figures? Because the Gospels bear witness, right? As documents, they bear witness. But living beings bear witness. So would it really be illogical to represent inspired documents, to represent them in a figurative way as creatures who give testimony and glory to God? Think about this. The four Gospels do ceaselessly offer pray. Every time someone around the world opens a Bible, the Gospels are there full of praise of God and Christ Jesus, right? As they, they both inspire praise and they're filled with praise, I would say. And every time that Jesus is remembered and recalled on the pages, they come to life. Uh, his deeds come to life. 
in uh, and through those inspired documents. So just consider that Irenaeus might be right, that this is a personification of the Gospels. And of course, behind the Gospels were, were actual writers. But I don't think it's showing us the writers directly. It's showing us a personification. If Irenaeus is right, I happen to think he is, but if he's right, it's the Gospels are being personified and their praise to God ceaselessly that they give as inspired documents in which the Spirit of God causes them to live as readers take in their testimony, that that's represented here. If that's right, what would the 24 elders be? Because if you would read this closely, they're similarly described. They're all around the throne. They're all worshiping God. They're sort of doing this in a unified fashion, similarly situated. But the 24 are called elders. And it literally means mature ones, older ones. And they are mentioned first. You notice they're mentioned before the four living creatures. Well, if the four living creatures are the four gospels personified in vision, Think about the 24 elders being the books of our Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. You might say, well, no, wait a minute. There are 39 of those books, not 24. Well, in our Bibles, uh, there are 39. But in traditional Jewish and Hebrew counting, there are 24. Uh, there were 24 in Jewish reckoning at the time that Revelation was written. We know, we know that from a Jewish writing called uh, Four Esdras. Uh, and the way they get, to, uh, uh, just briefly, is the, the, the books of, of Kings, Samuel, and Chronicles. They're really, they're really single books. They're broken into two, first and second Kings, first, first and second Samuel, first and Kings, first and second Chronicles. They're broken into two because none of them would fit on a single scroll conveniently. So they were split. But these are actually single books just divided for convenience. And then it was traditional in the Jewish system to combine Ezra and Nehemiah because the subject matter is, is just blends from one book into the, the next. So you, they would normally combine those into one book. And then what we call the minor prophets or the little prophets, Hosea through Malachi, they combine those into one book. It's called the Book of the Twelve. And so in traditional Jewish reckoning, you can, you can look this up on Wikipedia, Jew, uh, Jewish Bible, or Hebrew, it will say that the traditional Jewish numbering is 24 books. Now think of how that fits. 24 older ones. They're older, like the... The, fact, the, the reason we call it the Old Testament, right? Those are the inspired books that came before the Gospels and then the, the, the New Testament letters, of course, along with them. That makes perfect sense if the Gospels direct praise ceaselessly to God. So does the entire Hebrew Bible that was fulfilled in the Gospels by Jesus as the Gospels reveal him. And they have crowns uh, signifying the the uh, dignity uh, that they are accorded and the respect they are accorded. And as inspired documents, that fits very well as a way to represent them, I would say, and personify them. Now, I'm not, I'm not pushing on it. I mean, I'm certainly not giving this any kind of standing of doctrine. Their interpretations, they'll differ. But I think this has a lot to recommend it. And Jerome, the ancient translator, who, uh, whose uh, assignment of the gospel symbols, I think, was not correct, but he, he was giving it his best, his best shot. He did accept, he did believe that Irenaeus was apparently right uh, in, in at least assigning these figures to the gospel. Jerome, in his preface to, his, his, preface to his commentary on the books of Kings, he says the 24 older ones of Revelation are the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. So he was out of the opinion. I, you know, when I saw this and I looked at those books and it occurred to me that if Irenaeus was right, what made the most sense was for those 24 elders to represent the books of the Old Testament, to be personifications of those inspired documents. Um, 
it just struck me as a natural conclusion. I had no idea that Jerome had reached the same conclusion until I was reading along and <laughs> and there it was. He, he says it. So at least I think there is a, a strong possibility that we're seeing a representation of the fullness of the scriptures here in Revelation because the four gospels stand at the head of the Christian revelation, what we call the New Testament. And what stands at the head can represent the whole. I won't go into all the examples of that, but if you start paying attention to the Bible, you'll find there are many examples of that. What stands at the head can represent the whole. So the Gospels can represent the entirety of the, the, the of what we call the New Testament, inspired Christian scripture. So that's, that's one more interesting uh, wrinkle, uh, at least a strong interpretive possibility, I think, that we come to in having established these unique gospel identities and their associations with scripture. So I hope you've enjoyed that study. I hope it imparts something beneficial, something to think about, something to um, drive further study maybe and investigation. Uh, but I've enjoyed uh, presenting it and uh, I hope that it's of, uh, of some benefit to, to you in your walk. And so we'll close with prayer. Next time I'll have a new subject. There'll be some tie-in, I'm sure, <laughs> with where we've been, but it will be something new, a bit of a new direction. So let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for the beauties of your word. We thank you for the way your son uh, fulfilled and summed up the hopes of all mankind, of your covenant people, of all peoples. Uh, we thank you for the prospect of his kingdom of righteousness and peace when we look at the turmoil and uh, trouble and suffering in the world as it is now. Um, uh, thank you for uh, that promise. Uh, keep us safe in it. Uh, guard us by your spirit until we're back together again. Amen. And we'll see you next time. And uh, I, I should say I haven't had May with me. She was, um, she was working tonight. I forgot to acknowledge that at the start. But if you'll notice, I'm one short here because May had to work. But she will definitely be with me to introduce the next topic. So stay tuned.